Hi, I'm Ed Whittingham, and you're listening to Energy vs. Climate, the show where my co-hosts David Keith, Sarah Hastings-Simon, and I debate today's energy challenges, highlighting the Albertan and Canadian context. If this is your first time joining us, Energy vs. Climate is a live webinar and podcast that drops every other week. Visit energyversusclimate.com to register for updates and get exclusive access to join our live webinars, ask us questions, and engage with us directly. On today's show, we do a deep dive into decarbonizing the cement and concrete industry. Concrete, which is made from cement, is an essential part of the Canadian and global economy. It's a material that is used in virtually every building, construction, and infrastructure project across the country and the world. Canada's cement and concrete industry is responsible for 158,000 direct and indirect jobs, and its contribution to the Canadian economy is $76 billion in direct, indirect, and induced economic impact annually. The industry is also a major source of greenhouse gas emissions in Canada. In 2019, 1.5% or close to 11.2 megatons of Canada's greenhouse gas emissions came from cement and concrete production. What are some of its most promising technology and process solutions? What are the key opportunities and challenges on the path to decarbonizing cement and concrete? What should governments do to help these sectors to decarbonize? To help us with our deep dive, we were joined by Dr. Rebecca Dell. Rebecca runs the industry program for the Climate Works Foundation. Previously, she worked at the U.S. Department of Energy in the Obama administration, where she coordinated implementation of President Obama's Climate Action Plan. Prior to that, Rebecca was a scientist at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. She has a Ph.D. in climate science from MIT and is a researcher, author, and frequent podcast guest. Rebecca, David, Sarah, and I covered a lot of ground, so if you're looking for an in-depth discussion on an important part of decarbonizing heavy industry, then you've come to the right place. Now on to the show. So, Rebecca, let's start with the very basics. Um, first off, people tend to use the terms concrete and cement synonymously, as in the concrete and cement industry. And I expect that we might do the same during our discussion today. So off the top, can you just explain for us, what is the difference between the two? Sure. And thanks so much for having me. I'm very happy to be here. Um, So concrete is the material that we usually use. And it's a mixture of cement, sand, small rocks, and water. And the cement is basically the glue that holds the concrete together. So approximately 15%, between 10 and 15% of the concrete is the cement. Got you. So in in our intro to today's show, I talk about the concrete and cement industry slice of Canada's greenhouse gas emissions pie. But talk to us a bit about the global picture to put to put the industry in perspective. In the world, my understanding is we make about four billion tons of cement per year. So what percentage of global emissions does that account for? And are those emissions on the rise? Are they flatlining or are they actually decreasing as, as on our path to, to net zero by 2050? Yeah. So let's separate the production and the emissions, and we can talk about each of them. So on the production of cement, um, we thought that cement production it had stabilized at about 4 billion tons a year since about 2012, so for the last decade. Um, However, while the numbers for the last couple of years are still preliminary estimates, our best guess is that uh, cement production increased dramatically in 2020 and 2021. So we're now up to about four and a half billion tons per year. So if that's counterintuitive, given that we went through two COVID years, why did it increase? China. And also me building our house in Canmore. Well, yes. we all we all do our part, David. Yes. Yeah. We all pretty much have concrete foundations. Okay. Yeah. And so, so yeah, so the really, uh, so uh, many middle income countries, largest among them, India, have had kind of slow and steady growth in the amount of cement that they produce and use. But the real difference, the real driver of the uptick in the last couple of years 
appears to be increased production in China. Got you. And just so I understand it, increased production for export, for domestic consumption, or com- combination of the two? So there is a significant international trade in cement, but because it's so heavy, it is only cost effective to transport it internationally under rare circumstances. And so almost all cement is used domestically. But so then on the emissions side, mm-hmm. what that means is that the total impact of cement emissions on our global uh, greenhouse gases is much, much larger than in Canada. So we are, our best estimate is that of all CO2 emissions globally, the cement industry is probably responsible for about 7%. Well, so yeah, just to repeat what you said or rephrase it, a much larger slice of the global emissions pie relative to the Canadian slice. Yeah. And that is, that's also true for other high income countries that the kind of proportion of cement emissions in high income country emissions tends to be in the neighborhood of one to 3%, but it, it's much, much higher in particularly middle income countries. Got you. Okay. So let's just dive a little bit into why that is just in how you produce cement and concrete, the the fundamentals of the thermochemical process. So my layperson's understanding is that you get limestone out of rock plus heat, you add the heat, that equals you produce your byproducts of calcium oxide plus carbon dioxide. So after cooking the lime out of the limestone, in essence, you end up with the thing that you want, which is calcium for your cement, but you also end up with something that you don't want, which is CO2. And then you have the combination of the emissions that come from calcination, that calcination process, versus the emissions that you get from the heat that you need for the calcina- calcination. So can you, can you expand upon that for our listeners? And, and maybe at the same time, just to increase the challenge, just to find for us what's, what is a process emission. Ed, I'm, I'm a little skeptical of your characterization of yourself as a layperson, followed immediately by the use of the term calcination. <laughs> That's because, Rebecca, you and I have had the chance to talk about this topic before. So maybe I was a layperson, but you helped me to graduate to grade two in my understanding of cement production. That's very kind of you. Uh, Yeah. So the basic idea with cement production is that the most important ingredient in cement is lime, which is calcium oxide. And the main way that we get that is from limestone, which is calcium carbonate. And you can hear right in the words, calcium oxide versus calcium carbonate. There is carbon in the limestone. There's no carbon in the lime. And so you have this chemical reaction where you're decomposing the limestone into lime and CO2. And so that's not a energy reaction. That's not burning a fuel. It's a different kind of chemical reaction. It's called a calcination reaction, but it's producing a lot of CO2. And so that CO2 is just coming straight out of the rocks. And then, but in order to make that chemical reaction go, you need very high temperatures. And so you do need to burn a lot of fuel or uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be burning. Right now, the only way that we do this is by burning, but you need to input a lot of energy in order to make that chemical reaction go. And so if you burn fuel to input that energy, that produces more CO2 emissions. So you have the CO2 that's coming straight out of the rocks. You also have the CO2 that is coming from burning fuel to get the rocks hot enough to do that chemical reaction. And so you have, those are called your process emissions and your energy emissions. If you have a modern energy efficient cement kiln, it'll be about 60% process emissions, 40% energy emissions. If you have a old or not efficient cement kiln, it might be a higher percentage energy. Got you. And is it on about a one-to-one basis for one ton of cement, you get one ton of emissions or is it some different ratio? Approximately. Again, if you have a modern, efficient cement kiln, you can get it a little under one ton of CO2 per ton of cement. But good rule of thumb, for every ton of cement in the world, there's a ton of CO2 that went into the atmosphere. Wow. Okay. And we just talked about the billions of tons that are produced per year. 
Yeah. And it's kind of, it's kind of a, like, it's a, it's a striking thought that um, every cement kiln. So the, the factories that manufacture cement are called kilns because they're basically just these very, very hot ovens. Um, and so every cement kiln in the world is making as much CO2 as it's making cement. Got you. Okay. Now, before we sort of do a tour of the, the, the different technological and process options for starting to decrease those emissions or decarbonize cement and concrete production entirely. I know that some people call cement and concrete and other parts of heavy industry hard to abate, but I also know from our previous discussion, you don't like that term hard to abate. So why do people call it and why don't you like it? Um, so people call it hard to abate for a lot of reasons. Some of them are good. Some of them are less good. I would say if I'm being generous, the better reasons would be that, you know, in cement, the amount of CO2 that is emitted per dollar of revenue generated by the industry is very, very high compared to other industries. So you sort of have less room on your balance sheet to spend money on greenhouse gas emissions reduction in cement than you might in other industries. Uh, so that would be a better reason. A less good reason is, um, you know, maybe you own a cement company and you don't want to be asked to do anything difficult by your local policymakers. And so you s convince them that it's too hard and they shouldn't make you reduce your emissions. Um, so there's, there's more than one way you can look at this. Um, my attitude is that, um, that there's nothing inherently harder about making cement in a climate safe way than there is about making electricity in a climate safe way or providing transportation services in a climate safe way or making food in a climate safe way. Like all of these things have big challenges associated with them. The difference is that we got started as a society in a serious way on the electricity sector 25 years ago. And we're only just recently getting started in a serious way on cement. So it's not so much that it's inherently harder, it's that we're at an earlier stage. Yeah, and, and I guess, sorry, before we get to the solutions, why is that? Like you just explained to us what a large slice of the global emissions pie that it accounts for we spent a lot of time focusing on electricity, a lot of time focusing and beating up on oil and gas. Why? Why has the cement industry gotten a free pass, so to speak? Um, I think there's a lot of reasons for that. One is that the countries that have been the first movers on climate action, which are the higher income countries, have proportionally less emissions from cement than from other uh, types of economic activity. So they tend to kind of order their priorities in terms of their own emissions. Another reason is that it hasn't been businesses that have driven the, you know, have created impetus for climate action. It's been individuals, it's been citizens. And people pay an electricity bill every month. People get on uh, buses and trains, they drive cars, they eat food. And so, it's a lot easier for individuals to get excited and get involved in sectors that are more consumer facing. The cement industry, very, very little cement is sold to private citizens. Yeah, interesting. And so because it, it sort of feels removed from people's lives, it hasn't gotten as much attention. Yeah, and, that, and yet anyone who lives just about anywhere has at least a concrete foundation. And, and if I can just jump in for a second, there's a second yet. I mean, Rebecca, didn't you undersell it? In fact, maybe it's an easier to abate sector because at least for a set of cement kilns that are in places where there's good access to geologic storage, the abatement costs would be less than many other things we're actually doing in the economy today. Yeah. And I think there's a really strong argument to be made in many heavy industrial sectors that, you know, this activity and the greenhouse gas emissions tends to be concentrated in a relatively small number of very, very large facilities. So we're talking about maybe five or 600 facilities in the steel industry, 2,500, maybe a little more facilities in the cement industry, a similar number in the chemicals industry. And like, I think you could make a good argument that it should be easier as yeah. kind of an organizational and administrative matter to make 
a couple thousand interventions than to have to swap out the water heater and mobility device of every household in the country. Yeah, I got to jump in here too, as you were saying, I mean, this, this whole idea of what makes something hard to abate and the reference to the electricity sector that Ed picked up on, I thought it was interesting that it was California, I think on the sometime last week or the week before hit 97% renewable energy generation in the grid. Now, this is obviously a moment in time. It's not, uh, it's not over the month or anything like that, but, but it reminds me of, you know, if, if you rewind back, I'm sure you were part of some of those conversations, you know, 10, 15 years ago, utility system operators would say with a straight face, you know, it's just, it's simply not possible for us to manage the grid with more than 10% variable renewable energy on it. You know, it just, it just won't work. And, and so, I mean, I don't want to un- understate the technological challenges that do, you know, exist, but I think that point about, you know, what makes something hard, it's different being hard, technically hard, even, you know, whether or not it takes a lot of money, or if it's just, Hey, I, you know, often I like doing things the way that I do them. I know they work. I know how to manage that. And it's hard, you know, to change a socio-technical system. So. And and I'd add to that, Sarah, you'll have the industry and across industries will often say, take electricity. Well, we can't meet that renewable portfolio standard. You're crazy. We can't meet that clean electricity standard. You're crazy. It's impossible. And then they're given a target and given a deadline and usually come in and exceed the target before the deadline. Uh, But that seems to be the playbook, unfortunately, that we often have to go through across industries when they're first asked to make those deeper cuts. Yeah. And you'll notice that, you know, go back 20 years when um, people were still dismissing renewable energy advocates as like silly hippies who just didn't understand. Um, And I'm sure that for them, it probably felt like getting to an entirely clean electricity grid or even an 80% clean electricity grid. That I'm sure that felt pretty daunting. That felt hard. They did not go around calling it hard to abate electricity. Like that's not a useful way of characterizing what we're trying to do. No, I think I want to land on that. I just think it's, I'm really glad you're saying this and calling it out because for the set of cement plants that have easy access geological storage, you know, we'll, we'll get later into what the costs are, but let's just say they're 150 bucks a ton. There is a huge amount of stuff we're actually doing, including in many places, electric vehicles and rooftop solar and so on. That is actually more than that right now. Yeah. So, so it's it's really quite a statement that it's hard to abate and it it shows you the power of rhetoric. And I think it's really important to change this uh, story. I yeah. agree. And this is David. I know how often you're called a silly hippie who just doesn't understand. I think I'm still called that when I talk about renewables in Alberta, for the record. <laughs> I was hoping to get at least a <laughs> smile out of David on that. Yeah. Oh, there it is. There's a smile. Uh, all right. Well, I want I wanted to. I thought you guys were maybe going a little bit too into silly hippie and making it seem you were slipping into saying, well, it's just easy to get to, to decarbonize electric grids completely on renewables. I think there's no question it's doable, but I think the answer is it's actually still pretty hard. The, the, the point is it's really easy to get roughly the first half or so. And then in different places, it gets harder in different ways uh, uh, that, that we don't totally understand the next steps yet. Yeah. So let's get to, let's, let's do a little tour of the solutions potential solutions, technological pathways, process pathways to decarbonizing cement and concrete. And I will know that David has twice made reference to geological storage, which speaks to one big potential solution, one big hammer. So Rebecca, can you give us sort of the the, the big hammers that are available to us? Sure. So the first one, which is actually an extremely rich and complicated and important set of solutions is that we can just use less cement. And exactly what that means is like, there's a lot to unpack there, but we can blend cements that use less of the most greenhouse gas intensive uh, ingredients, basically use less lime to make cement of the same quality. We can make concretes that use less cement Uh, And we can use building design and structure design and construction techniques that provide that that create buildings and structures that are every bit as safe, every bit as comfortable and use a lot less concrete to provide the same services that feel the same to the people who are using them. So we have huge opportunities at the level of the cement, the level of the concrete and the level of the structure. 
to just use this material more efficiently. Now, so Rebecca, if I, sorry, if I can, it, it, one thing when you say that, so that makes a lot of sense. If I'm the engineer who has to sign off on the bridge that has been constructed with less cement and I'm tapping my iron ring, I think that's scaring the crap out of me. Is that maybe, maybe we'll get that to one of the challenges, but I, I can imagine there's just a, a big cultural barrier around the idea of using less concrete in, in infrastructure. Yeah. The thing you have to understand is I think that most people who have not looked at this issue probably assume that the amount of concrete that's going into buildings and structures today is like carefully calibrated to adhere to safety standards as prescribed in engineering best practices and building codes and things like that. That is not the situation. Um, Typically, particularly in a high-income country like Canada, um, the amount of concrete that is used in a structure is twice what is required to comply with the very safety protective engineering standards and building codes. So like we are nowhere near the nervous, the line where engineers could start to get nervous currently. We are very profligate in the way that we use this material. So surprise, surprise, engineers will over-engineer. It's not just over-engineering. It's actually, I mean, what drives this primarily is that cement and concrete are, they are incredibly valuable materials. Uh, Ed, I think you mentioned earlier that um, like basically every structure in a modern industrialized country has a concrete foundation. Like we could not have modern life without concrete. Very valuable, also incredibly cheap. So let me give you an example. A very common thing that happens with buildings is that the structural engineer will specify the size of the foundation that is required to hold up the building. And then the contractor shows up and they they have their specifications for what they need to do. But actually like building a mold that would carefully provide a foundation that's exactly the size and shape of the specified foundation is more expensive than just digging a hole that is larger than the specified foundation and filling the whole hole with concrete. I guess I want to inject a note of caution here. I think, Rebecca, from the little bit I know about structural engineering, you're absolutely right that we use much more cement than we need to narrowly adhere to the structural codes. But as some of my engineer friends point out to me, there's several things. One of it's what you just said, that actually there's a whole bunch of little ways in which this is cheap. And it's not easy to just fix those ways because it's not as if people are stupid now. And the other thing is that there's a safety factor about people actually not doing what the plans said they were going to do. So, you know, in aircraft design, we test airplane wings to failure. We know pretty much exactly where they fail. And a real airplane, if you do enough negative Gs, the 737 wings will come off pretty much just where we designed to come off. But, but we just don't build buildings that way. And, and if we did have buildings designed so they were just at the edge, uh, just where they just met structural codes, then in practice, more buildings would fail because actual constructors don't, in fact, do what's on the plans all the time. Yeah, but what an actual construction sites, people have studied this and the overwhelming conclusion that they have come to is that in actual construction sites, people use way more concrete yeah. than is yep. specified. Mm-hmm. I buy that. Okay. Um, yeah. But the other thing is also, you know, you said that people aren't stupid and that's correct. People are not stupid. Um, the reason that people aren't doing this now is not because it's very hard. And it's also not because they're too stupid to see the opportunity. It's because they have no incentive. Um, Fair point. Yeah. Rather, they have yeah. disincentives. Yeah. Yeah. If the risk is a lot of liability around that bridge fails or that foundation fails, that's a huge disincentive as opposed to any kind of incentive cost or otherwise to use less concrete. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So that's one. And so I'm glad we, we can have use, less. use less. Material like efficiency. Yeah. The conservation yeah. is, and there are some, and he likes that using less. Okay. So now let's and, talk about the, and some of that is really simple. Some of yep. that also involves cool technologies. Like for example, there's a new type of cement that is just starting to become commercially available in a few countries, which is called LC3, which stands for limestone and calcined clay cement. And this is an alternative cement formulation that was 
developed by uh, a bunch of academics and cement companies together. And basically they have developed a way of blending cement that is that can be used as a drop-in substitute for traditional cement, um, but has between 30 and 40% fewer greenhouse gas emissions associated with its production because it uses less of the most greenhouse gas intensive ingredient in their overall cement blend. So like that's an, a, that's a great new technology and that's an example of material efficiency because it's basically, it's what's called a low clinker cement. Got you. Could you then just follow up and define for us Portland lime cement? Because that seems to be the, the traditional cement. Yeah, actually. So the super traditional cement is what's called ordinary Portland cement. So when you have a cement kiln, the thing that comes straight out of the cement kiln is called clinker. And then ordinary Portland cement is 95% clinker, 5% gypsum. This ordinary Portland cement was first patented in 1824. So this is very traditional as a building material. Uh, more recently, um, Portland limestone cement has come into favor, which is 85% clinker, 10% ground limestone. So you didn't put it in the cement kiln, you just ground up the limestone and then 5% gypsum. So that reduces your greenhouse gas emissions by almost 10% and basically performs very, very similarly to ordinary Portland cement. And so, you know, increasingly the attitude has been, well, hey, if you can save 10%, why not? Um, and so that has been increasing in popularity. And then there are other options like LC3 and a lot of intermediate options that allow you to get what the, the portion of that really CO2 intensive ingredient, the clinker, get the portion of that further and further down. So when we talk about uh, changing the chemistry, like reducing the amount of calcium oxide and optimizing concrete mixes, is that separate or is that an extension of what you're talking about with LC3? So what we're talking about here in for those in the business is usually referred to as uh, just low clinker cement. Low clinker. Because you're still using the same basic ingredient, you know, this 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 clinker chemistry hasn't changed. And so then there's also a whole set of solutions, which are which are collectively referred to as alternative cement chemistries. And these are usually more radically different. So these are things where you're really doing different chemical reactions to glue your sand and pebbles together, but they still have in the end, um, a substantively civil, similar or equivalent structural behavior. So you may have heard, for example, of geopolymer cement. Um, you may also have heard of slag cements where they use um, industrial byproducts, mostly from the metals industry. Um, there's also a set of cements that, so uh, the way that ordinary Portland cement and other traditional cements work is the cement is a dry powder and then you activate it and you you get its gluing properties started by adding water. Um, so these are, we, we, we can call that hydration based cements because you add water and you get us and you get cementish, cementitious properties. There are also a set of cements where you can add CO2 to activate the uh, cement. Um, and so there are a bunch of companies that are just starting um, to bring products into the market doing that. And then the last kind of most wacky out there set of options are um, there's a there's a, a, a there's a number of efforts around the world to try and use microbes to grow cement biologically because um, basically if you think about um, Limestone is made out of the shells of teeny tiny microorganisms in the ocean. And so they can grow hard calcium rocks. And so can we use bioengineering to get uh, to, to develop microbes that can grow hard calcium rocks in exactly the way we want to and use that to make cement and concrete products? Mm -hmm. So those are your kind of set of your basic set of buckets. Got you. And while I may in grade two have encountered the word uh, calc calcination, I have not encountered cementitious. 
So that my, I, I feel like I'm just through this conversation graduating to grade three. Since we're talking about chemistry, let's talk about injecting CO2 into concrete because uh, there is a Canadian company called Carbon Cure that's received a lot of attention for doing exactly that. Yeah. So there's, I want to make a distinction between what Carbon Cure is doing. So Carbon Cure is still using these water based cements, um, but they are trying to increase the amount of CO2 that gets absorbed as the cement cures. And that's different from the technologies where we're actually using CO2 as the curing agent. So the you may have heard, for example, the, the most famous company that's using CO2 curing is something called Solidia. But what Carbon Cure is doing is, so we talked about how when you make the cement in the first place, you have this, you have rocks that have all of this carbon trapped in the rock and you're, and you have to put in a ton of energy to force the carbon out of the rocks. And what you might guess correctly from that is that at least if you wait long enough, that means that the rocks would be, if you just leave them alone, they would be inclined to reabsorb that carbon. Because if you have to put in energy to make the reaction go one way, that usually means you get energy out when the reaction goes the other way. And so what Carbon Cure is trying to do, and that's true, that cements and concretes very, very slowly. But if so quicker you if you grind them up. <laughs> yeah, but if you just yeah. leave them exposed yeah. to yeah. the air, they will absorb CO2. And Carbon Cure is basically trying to get them to do that faster and earlier. Um, I would say that, you know, Carbon Cure has gotten a lot of attention. I think the jury is still out on how, how much CO2 they are actually uh, either reducing in terms of emissions or trapping in their products. That's uh, we'll, we'll get to it soon, but I think the jury is, is I, I think that the real challenge is that compared to post-combustion capture and cost effectiveness where I, I'm, but we'll get there. We'll get there and we'll get to fuel switching as well. I, I was lucky enough to tour Biosphere 2 back in January. And cool. I know one of, one of the aha moments when they had the monitoring inside the Biosphere 2 was seeing um, CO2 levels going down and they traced it back to the concrete in Biosphere 2, slowly but surely absorbing some of that CO2. Yeah, I love that story so much. It was actually one of my postdoc advisors who wrote the paper that figured that out. Oh, was that Alan was like, Wright? Or, or? No, it was uh, Jeff Severinghouse. Okay. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, it was like uh, that story. I just, it makes me smile. I yeah, mean, me it's too. a shame about the people who couldn't control the contents of their atmosphere. And, you know, it, I, as I understand, it was very unpleasant for a while there inside. But um, but that the I love that the thing that 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 threw off the their atmospheric composition was that they forgot to account for the uh, carbonation of the concretes of the newly poured concretes. Yeah, it's such a neat story. I'm just thinking we should do a show on Biosphere Two and all the the learning that has come out of it. Uh, okay, but let's let's get to those other two big hammers and let's save the. But again, David made reference to capture. Let's save that to the end. So let's talk about fuel switching. Let's talk about uh, electrification in cement production, how you get get the emissions out of that that 40% that comes from the combustion process. So first off, like to, to starting like to create that heat that you need for the calcination, what typically is a fuel source today? Yeah. So today, 100% of the cement that is produced on earth gets so it's gets its energy from the combustion of solid fuels. Usually that's coal. Sometimes it is refinery byproducts like pet coke, sometimes it's trash. Um, but it's always the combustion of solid fuel. That's how we do it today. Sorry, not natural gas? There are so um I don't know of any cement kilns that are that use natural gas as their primary energy input. Some of them use it, you know, as sort of process assists in various places, but the actual kiln, I don't know of one that's run on natural gas. Okay. You certainly could. Um, but uh, so the thing that is um, 
uh, yeah, so that's, that's what we do right now. Um, and so when we talk about alternative fuels, we could switch to natural gas, still a fossil fuel has a lot of problems with upstream leakage associated with it. That doesn't feel like, I mean, I don't really see the need for a bridge, a natural gas bridge to something else. So I, I maybe, but I'm not really, not really sure why. Um, so, uh, then you, so then your options in terms of like actually clean fuels, one, another unattractive option is biomass. It's expensive. It's hard to get it sustainably. It's hard to get enough of it at all. So that's probably not going to be our bulk solution. And then you get to electricity and you can, people have lots of ideas for how you can make, uh, these chemical reactions happen using electricity, either through electric heaters of various kinds or just directly electrochemically. That has never been commercialized up to now. And the reason for that is not because we don't think it will work, but because we think uh, b- because electricity is more expensive than solid fuel pretty much everywhere today. To use the analogy, so my wife has a kiln for her pottery that we keep in our garage. And we power that through electricity, a 240 volt uh, outlet. And she uses that electricity to heat her kiln to fire her pottery. So you're saying on a grand scale, even at, and how many thousands or not, uh, what what temperature do you need to to get a kiln up to? Yeah. So in order to make Portland cement, the minimum kiln temperature has to be 1,450 degrees Celsius. Okay. So I was right in saying thousands. Um, Yeah. But we can, you can do that. Doesn't like violate the laws of physics. Doing that through electricity. Nope. And there's, you know, you like, the, and there's a lot of ways you can do it. You can do plasma heaters. You can do microwave heaters. You can do just direct radiative heaters. Um, like there's lots of ideas. The only barrier is cost um, because uh, in most places, even the industrial electricity tariffs, which are often lower than your residential electricity tariffs. But even the industrial tariffs might be uh, uh, four or six or eight times higher per unit of energy than solid fuel purchasing. Can I jump in with, please? I was just going to jump in with a question actually, and it maybe applies more generally uh, to various things that we've discussed as abatement opportunities. Um, But how hard is it to, to sort of retrofit or go back. And I know Ed, maybe we'll come to this later, but I, I'm thinking about, okay, so we have our installed fleet of uh, cement plants. Um, you know, what are things that you can go and do sort of, you know, on a one-off basis relatively easily? You know, can you swap a, a combustion fuel for electricity if you have a electricity source available? Or are we talking about having to build all new plants? And what does that look like? Yeah, I've never seen a concept for how you could convert an existing cement kiln into an electric cement kiln. All of the concepts I've seen involve building a new kiln. In many instances, you would want to build the new kiln on the same site as the old kiln because usually we chose those sites because they're like sitting on top of a high quality limestone deposit. Um, but I don't, I don't know that you could do that as a retrofit. Yeah, I think this is where the difference between lime production and calcium uh, and cement is real. So you might just think they're about the same thing. But for lime, they're very thermodynamically efficient processes. They run just a little under a thousand C, and there's more plausible ways to make those electric. We've certainly thought about that at carbon engineering, as you can imagine. But for cement, you need this much higher temperature, higher than you need just to drive the CO two off, in order to make this stuff active for the hydration reaction. Yes. And, that and is... I think it's, if you try and imagine doing that, re- retrofitting a rotary or similar kiln to doing that with, with electricity, it's essentially impossible to imagine, I would say. Yeah. There is a, um, so uh, there's a pilot project um, that the European Union has been sponsoring called LILAC um, that is uh, a new kind of cement kiln that's designed to produce a pure stream of CO2 um, from the calcination reaction. And that is a design concept 
that would be very appropriate for um, electrification. Um, so like David is correct that the lime is easier than the cement, but we do think like there's, there's no conceptual barriers to an electric cement kiln, but there are practical barriers and nobody has ever gone through the work of overcoming those practical barriers because of the economic barriers. Got you. And we will get to barriers, policy, technology, cost, cultural in just a second, but we've saved the biggest hammer to the end, and that is carb capture. So talk to us about carbon capture. And really, we've gone through theoretical chemistries, using less concrete, electrification. In the near term, is decarbonization of cement and concrete, does it really begin capture? Uh, so, yeah, car my attitude is that if you look across the entire economy, the place where the case for carbon capture is strongest is in the cement industry. Uh, I think that if, if we're going to use carbon capture at all, we probably are going to want to use it in the cement industry. Um, and the reason for that is like we were talking about, you have a majority of the CO2 is just coming straight out of the rocks. And so you can't leave that in the atmosphere. You have to capture it somehow and store it somehow if we're going to continue to use traditional cements. I don't know if this is where you're going with it, but I mean, that the fact that, um, Rebecca, that you said that, uh, that cement is, you know, the most or the best fit for CCS or something, if I'm paraphrasing, I yeah. think it's really interesting in the Canadian context, obviously with the recently announced um, CCS tax credit, right? That came out in the budget um, last week, I believe, losing track of time, uh, but but it's an um, investment tax credit that basically will provide 50% uh, of the upfront costs for uh, CCS facilities in Canada. Um, and so, I mean, I guess one thing that leaves me wondering now, and, and maybe the rest of us, is you now have this, you know, significant source of funding. We also, of course, have a carbon price that is in principle um, rising to $170 a ton in 2030, but at least is already, uh, you know, on its way there. Do you think that we're going to see big movement within the cement industry in Canada or, you know, yeah, maybe that was not a good way to, <laughs> to, to I mean, put the question, but I'll stop there. <laughs> so those numbers sound big enough to me to justify uh, investment by the Canadian cement industry. Um, I will add a caveat to that, which is that, you know, I'm based in the United States. Here in the United States, I can, there's a half a dozen facilities that I can point to around the United States that like very obviously a carbon capture project would pencil out under current policy and they do not appear to be pursuing them. Yep. And so, like I said, those numbers certainly sound big enough to make pro to, to make the, the, the most attractive projects pencil out. That does not necessarily imply that they will happen. Maybe that brings us to this question of barriers uh, and David's question too about the trade-off. So, you know, where does the industry go from here? Yeah, I mean, there's an interesting kind of set of policy experiences that we have from other sectors where sometimes efforts to entice firms to do what we think, you know, to, to do the, the right thing for climate um, are less effective than uh, requiring them. Got you. So let's so let's talk about the challenges because up here in Canada, at least, it seems that there is no shortage of goodwill and strong publicly stated commitments within the cement and concrete industry. It's trying to find 15 megatons of cumulative reductions by 2030. It wants to get to net zero by 2050. It's got a partnership with the Canadian government to do that. The Canadian government's throwing money at it. What are the big barriers in between cost, technology, policy, lack of public pressure, all of the above? Like what stands out? Maybe I I'd mean, like to. That, that's that's open to anyone. It's not just Rebecca. Open to David, Sarah, who wants to jump in. Oh, so I, I mean, um, if we posit that the Canadian cement industry is sufficiently motivated and the government is putting up sufficient money 
then that should do it. But honestly, the cement industry, in terms of their public statements, have been one of the most friendly to climate action for a very long time. Uh, they organized the, you know, the cement sustainability initiative like almost 20 years ago at this point. Uh, that has not translated into action. Um, and, and I think it's because the, the best answer I can offer is that they haven't want they, they haven't felt like they could make money and they haven't wanted to spend the money and they haven't wanted to accept the technology risk. And and partly they haven't been able to make money because even is it so let's say in Canada where we're on the path to a hundred and seventy dollar carbon price by twenty thirty. My understanding is once you get to a hundred dollar per ton carbon price, that, that doubles the cost of cement. And so it's it's a low margin business to begin with. That's kind of the biggest barrier. Am I right? Well, so Ed, I I don't sorry. know enough about how the cement industry works in or how the carbon pricing works in Canada, mm -hmm. but in other places with carbon pricing, the cement industry has very effectively lobbied for free allocation of tradable permits under for emissions trading or things like that that have reduced to basically to zero in most cases, the actual cost of the carbon price that they have to pay out of pocket. Yeah. yeah like and I was just going to say that's, that's exactly what it is. Sorry, David, then I'll let you jump in. But in Canada, that's exactly the state that we're in. So you have this significant amount of uh, output-based allocations uh, in Canadian system. And so the cost, you know, the average carbon cost paid by the cement industry is relatively low. The marginal cost is higher, but you know, the question remaining of, is that enough to actually motivate, you know, somebody to take action? I feel like we're sort of dancing around the core point, which is uh, from what I understand in cement plants that happen to be near sedimentary basins where geologic storage is pretty easy, retrofits are possible. It's true. Nobody has done this at commercial scale yet, but there's every reason to believe it's possible. There are, you know, and, and, and the costs look like there. I really want to hear Rebecca's estimate, but of order a hundred dollars a ton. Is that fair? Yeah. So I think the you know it's hard to know, but the estimates that are out there are all fall between one and two hundred dollars a ton, and and certainly we think that like you know the early ones might be closer to two hundred dollars a ton, but we should be able to get to a hundred bucks a ton. Should be totally so, doable. So, what makes them two hundred a ton? How is that consistent with what we think about CCS costs on other systems? Because it seems very high. I mean, part of it is this, in the trade-off between post-combustion and oxy fuel, where maybe for some other processes they're close to balanced. When you have all the process CO two, post-combustion looks worse because you've got to pay all the energy and capex for the post-combustion. Whereas for oxy fuel, you're just doing the capture on the on the fuel you burned. And given the retrofit evidence, how, you know, I guess, how comfortable are you that the high end prices other than maybe plant one are really 200? I mean, I like my bottom line is that uh, the is that if we have learned anything from the history of environmental regulation, it's that the cost of compliance with regulations ends up having very little to do with the expected cost of compliance with regulations before we actually take the actions. And so I don't think we know how much this will cost. Oh. I think there's good reasons to believe that the, that the costs will be, I mean, I think under any circumstances, even if we're at the high end, then that actually, the costs will be perfectly affordable because cement, we were talking about earlier, is cement and concrete are so cheap that the things we actually buy, which are like buildings and infrastructure, typically the cost of the cement in those, uh, in, in the final projects is like between a half a percent and one and a half percent of the cost of the project. So it's affordable even if the cost is high, but I do not feel comfortable saying confidently that it's going to be at the low end of the range because nobody's done it yet. Although we've got projects that have been proposed. I mean, right here in, in the province of Alberta here, there's a feasibility analysis on a CCS project underway at Lehigh Cements plant in Edmonton. Now, yeah. have I, they published a 
uh, an estimate for the, a cost estimate yet? I didn't think they had. So I, I don't know. And okay. I'd be curious to see that in 100 to 200 is a broad range. But when you're getting up to $170 per ton by 2030 and an investment tax credit now of 50%, then I think you're getting close to numbers that pencil. The, the key gap right now, when I talk to various industries, including the, the cement industry, is the policy certainty. So you might get those numbers to pencil, but then we've got a government, let's say we change government here in a few years, and they take a big write down on the carbon price, then suddenly you're left in the red on your project, which is why the federal government up here, Rebecca, and its last budget, made a reference to a carbon contract for difference policy and get that in, make it bomb proof. So no future government that is more hostile, or less ambitious around a carbon price can blow it up that we're going to use some entity. And in this case, they use the Canada infrastructure bank as the pro proposed entity that will provide that guarantee in the carbon price through to 2030 so that your numbers continue to pencil. And I think on the policy side, my understanding, it seems like, well, we've done lots, got that higher carbon price, got the investment tax credit. That's the missing piece of the puzzle right now. And if you can get that in place, then you're going to enable a bunch more projects. I would like to actually push back on that. That sounds wonderful. And in a rational world, that would work. Yeah. But my experience has been that this industry in particular is very small C conservative. So if they can continue to have a viable business by doing things in the traditional way, that is their overwhelming preference. And so if you have a high carbon price, but you have free allocation of you know, output-based uh, permits, then you can continue to have a going concern by operating in the traditional way. I feel like there's really lots of public policy failures here. And I feel like we're, we're sort of dancing around this. So so Rebecca, first of all, of course, on the one hand, you're right. There's some level in which we don't really know what things cost until we build them a lot, but we don't know nothing. There are lots of estimates that we've seen for sulfur scrubbers and for other things where we actually, I mean, there was clearly real information in those estimates. And just to push you a little bit, you can't both say you think it's the place that it makes most sense and cheapest and that you just don't know. The answer is somewhere I, in between. Yeah. I did not say that it was okay. the place that it makes the most sense because it's the cheapest. It's the place that it makes the most sense because there are the fewest alternatives. Mm -hmm. Fewest viable alternatives that come anywhere near um, 100 to 200 bucks on a cost per ton basis. Like, like electrification, for instance, what, what's the cost yeah. of electrification on a per ton basis? No, even if you electrify, you still have to do the CCS because you the electrification sure. only gets rid of your energy emissions. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, okay. fair point. I mean, I'm sorry, I'm just... Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I guess for me, a whole crux of this is, is why have we not had public funding for a feed study? This stuff is actually close to knowable. And I mean, there's people dancing around a bunch of, can I just say it, bullshit startups, where I think the probability of them actually having carbon avoided costs for making cement comparable to post-combustion capture of extra plants is, I'm not going to say zero, but it's like 1%. And, 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 and I think I, I agree with, with uh, very much agree with Rebecca's pushback to Ed. I think what we've seen is that getting real action like this takes government involvement to push some industries to do stuff. And there are lots of levers we could do. One of them is to partly fund or require a feed study that gets actual vendors to make real quotes with performance guarantees. And this still doesn't tell you for sure what a thing costs, but it tells you much more about what a thing costs. I agree a hundred percent. That would be an excellent use and, of and, a few million dollars of public money. And, and I think what we have is a system where we are, people are so hyped on innovation that we have a bunch of startups getting money for, you know, weird electrochemical pathways that, you know, maybe could work in another 50 years in a different world or for, you know, like adding CO2 to slurry where you, you know, the cost of trucking CO2 anywhere is 200 bucks a ton. Uh, that just the the chance of these things being cost competitive compared to just capturing from some big plants seems very very small to me. Am I am I being over optimistic? I, I get it that it's hard to predict costs in advance, but it's not it's not impossible to predict costs in advance. We do know something about this. We've been doing CO two capture 
in different forms uh, at industrial scale for more than 50 years. We've been putting CO2 underground for a long time. These are industrial processes that exist. I feel like we're sort of losing that, that core piece of information. This isn't all equally uncertain. I, I'm not sure, David, that we're losing it because when okay. I talk to the cement industry itself, they're the ones who, in quiet conversations, will say, really, the big hammer we have, especially in the short term, is carbon capture and storage. And that's why you know you, you look at theoretical chemistries, high cost, small volumes, yeah, using less cement. On sure. on David's side, like if you know, you have made a lot of comments about how the um, uh, uh, about how the cement industry is bought in, and they really want to do this. Well, you know what? Lehigh is a very large company. Heidelberg is a very large company. Semex is a very large company. All of them could have easily afforded to have done studies like the one that David just described at any point in the last twenty years. I, I think I don't blame the companies. Companies are there to mostly protect their bottom line, and they're going to try yeah. and avoid regulation. That's their job. I really blame public leadership for not being driven by basic science and techno-economics to look at where the relatively cheap places were to squeeze, squeeze CO2 out of the system and, and fail to do that and instead spent money on stuff that were bobbles. I think it, that's also a problem of an over-reliance on carbon pricing as you know the climate policy mechanism, right? I think it has a good role to play, but I mean, sort of to Rebecca's point, you know, the federal government could just decide to say, now, I mean, within, you know, legally how exactly they do this, I'll leave to the lawyers. But, you know, in principle, you could decide to say we are going to require all cement produced in Canada to have CCS by, you know, year X under this increasing schedule from today. Right. And, and we are very allergic, some within the climate community to that even though we certainly do that with all kinds of other pollution that are generated from industrial facilities. You know, we don't tell people you can, you know, dump this amount of this chemical into the public waterways and we'll charge you this amount and hope that therefore you change your mind about what you're going to do. So, I mean, I think that's another one that another area where the, the very conservative nature of the companies really doesn't match up with this theory of carbon pricing and the marginal price driving the emissions reductions, which then creates all these, you know, allocations you can sell. You know, I think what we're seeing in practice, and I mean, maybe I'm wrong, and maybe now that we have this CCS tax credit, you know, over the next year, this will all happen. But barring that, I think one really has to go back to this, you know, theory of how exactly we're going to get some of these more traditional industries to actually move. So I'm typically not the defender of industry and government. But in this case, <laughs> so to your point, Rebecca, yes, it's not just Lehigh's decision. That decision is going to be made in Germany, right? So Lehigh, you can't take that decision on its own. So this is the problem with the cement industry in whoa, Canada. Whoa, 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 whoa. They could whoa. take a lot of decisions in Canada. The they, Canadian you know, they government could make the decision for sure. No, but yeah, you tell me that like, Lehigh... You know, Lehigh Lehigh can make that decision itself as opposed to, as opposed to, to Heidelberg. Go to the, CEO, the global CEO. <laughs> no, no, but the reality is a lot of these companies, they're not headquartered in Canada and they have to go just like the big oil and gas companies. Like how many decisions can Shell Canada take on Cry its own without going to the river? Hay? No, but hear me out. Hear me out. So, but there- also, I one thing I do want to say, though, is I think so. David is very annoyed that we have invested in baubles instead of simple, practical, demonstrated technologies. I don't think that's what happened. I don't think we've invested at all. Well, um, like it's, it's not that we're misallocating our innovation. Our I'm, I'm just to find our agreement. I, I mean, I, I think, I think, it wait, David, David, let me, let me speak. Right. Let me speak. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a defender of government because the federal government realizes from my discussions where the problem lies no. and it's not where I, they know. No, no, I've had those discussions. They know where the problem lies and they're starting to invest in it. And they're starting to invest to design the policy tools, thus the investment tax credit, the carbon price, a carbon contract for difference and the strategic innovation fund, which is a big pot of money, not for the investments in the theoretical chemistries. That's to get CCS going. I feel Mm -hmm. like I sat around with a deputy minister of Environment Canada having just this conversation a little bit before COVID, and it was pretty clear that there were 10 or 15 people in the room, and they were all excited about carbon cure, and I felt like there was very little basic knowledge about relative costs and where the CO2 is and what the options are. I I just don't agree with you, Ed. 
Okay. Yeah. Well, I, mean, I from my discussions, yeah. they're they're much your lips closer to, to God's ears, Ed. Yeah. Much closer to understanding where the problem is, as is the industry, and it's not the theoretical chemistries. But, so we I have to have, but like the the everything that you just described, Ed, still falls under the rubric of enticing co- companies into action. And I, uh, like Sarah, I share Sarah's skepticism that enticement is an approach that is capable of working. It might be an approach that is capable of getting us started. We'll see. But like, you know, I think that um, that I, I would be much more confident that the government had a robust analysis of the situation and a plan to deal with it if they had been making relatively modest investments in actually scoping out solutions a la what David was talking about and had been, you know, doing regulatory requests for information about how to structure a long-term product standard for, as opposed to having conversations about lavish subsidies. Yeah. And I would real, real conversations about a ramp down rate for the free allocations under the carbon pricing. So I think, I think Rebecca, we should have you back on and I don't know what the yeah, fair time frame yeah. to give is it, you know, two years or something, but like to see what is the state of announcements <laughs> and start of construction of uh, CCS facilities on cement in Canada, I will be able to settle the the disagreement then. And, and completely agree. It's not just carrots, it's sticks. I agree. I've spent my career working on the two. We need more sticks. And part of it is tightening up our carbon pricing system. And, and this is a place where sticks are con- very appropriate for the reason that Rebecca said earlier, because the industry really can't drift to other countries. So you could imagine a pretty simple scheme that was like a CO2 uh, intensity standard tradable only inside that industry that basically forces, I think you don't want to say every plant because some plants aren't near storage. But you could have something that was across only those plants, a lot of which are owned by the same company that drives them down pretty quickly, do it hard enough that you know one of them's got to build a plant if they still want to sell product, and they can't just migrate out of country. I think there's easy ways to do this, and government chose not to do it. And I mean, I had this conversation more than 10 years ago with the Canadian government. I think it's 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 a systematic abandonment of government's duty to actually focus on cost-effective environmental protection in this case. So the first thing I would say is that a system that, so what David's describing is, I think, in many ways analogous to the low carbon fuel standard in um, uh, California. And there has been a growing conversation over the last couple of years that cement would be an appropriate uh, market for a policy of a similar structure. Agreed, though this would be even simpler because the LCFS has all these complicated life cycle that would, given the sort of what you said again, that there aren't very many cement plants and they're pretty similar, it just wouldn't be very hard to implement. Yeah. The, I mean, I'm not saying there's no nuances here. There are definitely nuances, but it's uh, the cement industry, as all told, is a simpler industry than the motor fuels industry. Um, and the other thing is that, like, uh, there's not no international trade particularly if you know the so there is some international trade in cement but it's all it's almost all maritime trade um because that's the cheapest way to ship things and it's, that's the only cost effective way to ship cement long distances but like the low carbon fuel standard you can impose the same requirements on cement importers because there's only going to be a couple of ports of entry and it's a simple product that's easy to count sure the I, So I like California's LCFS system with Canada. We've spent six years, six years designing our clean fuel standard. So all we can say is its performance is TBD. We <laughs> just don't know. So before I say, yes, let's extend oh. it to cement. It's like, let's see how the system plays out. It's anyone's guess at this point. It is hard to get things over the finish line. (laughs) But I think we're asking for something much simpler, though, right? Uh, The problem with Can, I would say the problem with Canada's LCSF is the the complexity, right? We're really just talking about let's look at the single product and uh, and look at what can be done within that space. And and coming back to, you know, David, your point around sort of what government has or hasn't done, I think this actually ties back to the conversation we had a couple episodes ago uh, with Danny Roderick around. uh, industrial policy and the the capabilities within the federal government to you know really uh, and and this is not a dig against you know the the 
people that are working there. This is about, you know, do you have the people in the team? Is the federal government set up in a way yep. that it includes these, you know, engineering experts and real deep, you know, product and co content knowledge experts? And that's not the way the government in Canada under, you know, this administration or the previous administration has functioned. No, and can that's I, so for me, it's I, simple. Can I beg a moment sure. of indulgence on that front? Sure. So this is about the U.S. government, but I think it's it's stark. So um, the organization within the U.S. government that is responsible for thinking about the future of American manufacturing, advancing American manufacturing, cement and all other manufacturing sectors is the Advanced Manufacturing Office at the U.S. Department of Energy. Even though the manufacturing sector has a approximately the same impact on employment and GDP as the healthcare sector in the United States. The budget of the Advanced Manufacturing Office is 1% of the budget of the National Institutes of Health. And the head of the Advanced Manufacturing Office is five ranks below the head of the National Institutes of Health in the federal hierarchy. And that position, head of the Advanced Manufacturing Office, has been vacant for five years. Yeah, and that like when you say, do you have the people in place with the knowledge and the incentive and the motivation and the institutional capacity to do this work? Uh, not yet. Yeah, that's why I think design a simpler LCFS is oxymoronic, just because you typically don't have the people. That's why it's taken six years in Canada. And the fact, until very recently, cement has had no home in the federal government. It's had no home. It does now, this is one step forward, in addition to standards and buy clean and the strategic innovation fund, but that is only a very recent thing. Yeah, in the entire US federal government, I did a little survey um, last year before the passage of the infrastructure law, um, and I was able to identify approximately $20 million a year across the entire federal government to be spent on cement innovation of any kind, climate and otherwise. Which twenty million dollars in if you were wondering, that's like that's like the federal equivalent of the change between your couch cushions. We're gonna leave it at that on the need for more money. <laughs> <laughs> we need more money, more resources, more effort. Uh, Rebecca, thanks. This more is I people. feel and more people. Yeah, we yes. didn't I, I add that. I wanted to get to capacity and we didn't we didn't even scratch I thought we, need we more would, of everything. I thought we would actually talk more. We'd, we'd hope to touch upon your your very interesting and exciting, important work in steel. We ran out of time. We've gone over time just on cement and concrete. Uh, but I, if you, if you're into a deep dive on one heavy <laughs> industry and how to decarbonize it, we've just had the discussion for you, and and that's all thanks to you, Rebecca. Oh, with my pleasure. Uh, I. Uh... I, I find cement and concrete very exciting, so maybe some of your listeners will also. I'm very happy to have been on the show. Thanks for listening to Energy versus Climate. The show is created by David Keefe, Sarah Hasing simon and me, Ed Whittingham, and produced by Eva Voinijescu. Mika McFarlane, Crystal Hickey, and Christina Pearson provide webinar support. Our title and show music is The Windup by Brian Lips. Sign up for updates and exclusive webinar access at energyversusclimate.com. Interact with us live every other week and subscribe to the podcast wherever you listen.